Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? I'm going to read it one more time. This is the New King James Version. It says, Jesus said to her, speaking to Martha, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? If I could share a thought with you, it would be simply, what did I tell you? Mm -hmm. Here we have the story of Lazarus' death. And we've all, or most probably, are familiar with it and how everything went down. But I want to take a look at how it affected Martha. How it caused her, who was a believer, to question Jesus. To question his response in light of what had already taken place. We know that she loved Jesus. She followed and supported his ministry. And even created a welcoming place for him to rest in between or during ministry assignments. She had, witnesses, had witnessed Jesus' power, his power over many things of this earth, the flesh. She heard him preach the gospel to the lost. And she heard of the miraculous things that he did, even raising the dead. By all accounts, Martha was a believer. Many of us sitting here, we've heard, we've seen, we've learned, we've studied. Or even if we don't have that close relationship, we've heard by word of mouth what this Jesus guy can do. I don't think there's anyone sitting in here, whether you're a believer or not, that you didn't hear about Jesus. We've heard about what he can do with the sick. We've heard or maybe seen, or for those of us, we've even witnessed how he can take your little and make much. We've seen or heard or even experienced. It may have not been a few loaves and some fish, but that can of beans and some Franks fed your family. We've seen how he's taken the little bit that you had and stretched it to get everything that you need. Or when you didn't have, someone came to you and gave you what you needed. We've seen him make provision. We've seen him come through in a clutch. We've seen him orchestrate the unorchestratable. We've seen him do the undoable. We've seen him make possible the impossible. We've either seen, heard, or experienced it firsthand. But there are times when life gets you in that bind where if we're not careful, we like Martha, no matter what we've seen or what we've heard, we still revert back to what's not happening. The challenge for you and I as believers and the challenge for those of you that aren't believers is to take Jesus at his word even when the world is doing something different. The challenge for each of us, whether you're a believer or non-believer, is to take Jesus at his word even when your situation is saying something different. Let's look at Martha's situation. John 11, and 20, John 11, 23, and 24. It says, Jesus said to her, now pay close attention, this back and forth between the two. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus was sick, excuse me, Lazarus was sick and close to death. And she sent word, meaning Martha sent word to Jesus because she knew that he could heal Lazarus. She felt that since Jesus was close to him, close to them, he would be more inclined to move on their behalf and to come heal her brother. But he didn't show up in time and now her brother is dead. Jesus told her what could happen, but she only sees what did happen. Her situation is that 
she can either trust the one who's saying what she needs or she can follow what the world is showing what she has. In one hand, she has the living word telling her there's life, but in the other hand, she has the world showing her her dead brother. In one hand, she has the living word telling her that if you believe, this can happen, but in the, on the other hand, she has the, word, the world showing her that all you have is gone. How many times are we faced with that conflicting, that conflicting uh, decision to either forego what we see and trust what we've heard or eliminate what we've heard and just accept what we see? Too many times we'll give in to the world and what it's showing us and we'll put more energy into accepting than we'll put into expecting what Jesus has said to us. Let's look at Martha's frustration. John 11, 25 through 27. Again, look at the exchange between the two. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, <laughs> the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Martha knew Jesus had the power to heal her brother because she was an eyewitness to a few of his miracles. She saw him do it for others, so what's the problem now? What's holding him up? Why didn't he get here in time to save Lazarus? Normally, he moved fast to fathers. But since he didn't get there in time, her frustrations caused her to nullify what he could do in her impossible situation. Let's go back to the scriptures. That, that 11, 25 to 27. Notice what Jesus said. In her impossibility, in her frustration, he tells her, I am the resurrection. After she tried to give him a discourse in theology about, I know that he'll be here in the resurrection in the last day. He turns to her and says, forget your theological stance. I am the resurrection. You're telling me about something that'll happen in the future. I'm telling you that the future is happening now. Just believe in what I'm saying to you. I am the resurrection. I am the one who calls those dead things to get up. I am the one who can revive everything that you lost. I am the one that can bring back to life all the dead things that you're dealing with. Do you believe it? He got a little indignant with her. He said, I am the resurrection. Don't tell me about the resurrection that's going to come. Who do you think is going to make that happen? He's telling her, I am the resurrection. Well, look at her response. She said in verse 27, she said, and it says, she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. He asked her, do you believe that I'm the resurrection? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ. Hold it. Hold up. Wait a minute. He said, do you believe that I'm the resurrection? She said, yeah, I believe you're the Christ. I'm going to say it one more time for the people in the cheap seats. He said, do you believe that I'm the resurrection? She said, yeah, I believe you're the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus asked her very plain and succinctly, do you believe that I can get your dead brother up? She said, yeah, I believe that you're the Messiah who comes back to save the world from the sins. When we get caught up in what we're going through, we'll even start to nullify what Jesus can do in our lives. When we get caught up in the cares of this world, we'll start telling Jesus what he can and can't do.
But I'm here to tell you right now, it doesn't make a difference how big your problems are. It doesn't make a difference what you're going through. It doesn't make a difference what the doctor's report says. It doesn't make a difference what your bank account says. It doesn't make a difference how you feel. All you need to know that if God said that it's going to happen, you need to stand on it. All you need to know that if God declared it, you need to go ahead and declare behind him. If God made the decree, you make the declaration because we can't decree. But if God said that he'll heal you, know that you'll be healed. If God said he'll deliver you, just walk in your deliverance. If God said he'll keep you in the fiery furnace, don't worry about putting on the asbestos flame suit. Just go ahead and walk on through the fire because whatever God says, I believe it and that settles it. Just look at somebody and tell them, what did I tell you? <laughs> Let's look at Martha's limitations. We saw her in a situation. We saw her frustration. Let's look at Martha's limitation. John 11, 39 and 40. It says, Jesus said, here it is. Watch, watch this conversation. Jesus said, take away the stone. I ain't tired of arguing with her now. Take away the stone. But look at Martha. Martha, the sister of him who was dead. Now, hold on. Let's stop right there. It's something how the writer, <laughs> how the writer really brings out Martha's position. Because if you read that whole story, it keeps talking about Martha, the sister of the one who was dead. So her whole position in life at this particular point was my brother's dead but we can't be too upset with her because remember the males in the family that day were the providers the males in the family that day were the ones who covered the males in the family that day were the ones who protected they were the ones who gave provision they were the ones who gave stability they were the ones who gave security so she's now lamenting walking in everything that she lost. She lost her provision. She lost her security. She lost her foundation. She lost her brother. She lost her, 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 her sustenance. She lost everything that she possibly would need on this earth. But Jesus is trying to let her know, don't you dare compare me to your brother. I'm the one who gave him the provision. I'm the one who gave him the security. I'm the one who gave him the knowledge. I'm the one who, I'm his foundation. So even if he goes away, just come and trust in me. But it said, Martha, the sister of him who was dead. Lord, y'all got me perspired. Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. You're making me nervous, making me nervous. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, now Jesus then says something to her, now she's saying back to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. So she went from trying, oh, let's, let's keep reading, I'm, I'm ready to go. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? Now here she goes again. She tried to school him in theology. Now she wanted to take him to mortuary science school. <laughs> Jesus, you know good and well rigor mortis is set in. <laughs> That's what it said? Now it didn't say rig particularly rigor mortis, but she said stench, he's stinking. After four days, any mortician is out there? What sets in after four days of a dead body? Thank you. So she's schooling him on the visible, physical flow of life. She's trying to school Jesus on the visible, physical cares of this world. She's trying to let Jesus know that uh, you can't, uh, no, we can't, we, can't, oh, we can't overthrow or we can't go past the visible, physical circumstances that we have in front of us. 
But Jesus didn't ask her about what you see. He said, didn't I say to you, don't you, but if you would believe. He said, stop telling me about the visible physical because I'm sharing with you the invisible spiritual. Because what I say is going to be more than what you see. Right? Right? What does the Bible tell us? That faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Right? So he's trying to get her outside of what she sees. He's trying to get her out of, outside of what she feels. He's trying to get her out, out of what this world is saying to her and he wants her to walk in the power of his word. All because he said it. Don't you worry about what's happening. Just declare God's word. He said don't worry about how far this thing is going. I'm, you're telling me about what happened in time. I'm the one that exists outside of time because I'm from eternity past to eternity future. I'm the one who's infinite. I'm the one who there is no beginning and there is no end. So don't tell me about what happens in your little finite measure of time. I'm the one who exists outside of time. As a matter of fact, I told time to start and I will tell time to end and time will have to cease. But even though heavens and earth shall pass away, the word of the Lord shall remain until the end. So don't tell me about what's happening in your time. Her problem was that her belief in Jesus' power was limited to her being able to physically see him work. And then she was putting a, a, putting a box around him which was tailored to the constraints of this world. She only believed in what she could see happening within a certain time. She had to see him touch the problem before the problem was out of control. How many times do we, we get up and praise God and shout when the problem hasn't totally overcome us? Or we'll dance and shout, we'll speak in tongues, roll around on the floor when we think there's still time. But what do you do when the problem takes over? What do you do when what you are afraid of to happen actually happens? What do you do when the final decision has been cast and the book has been closed? Remember, Jesus is the one who can open the book and rewrite your name. <laughs> Gee, as a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't operate by a set of books on this earth. Jesus has his own books. <laughs> as a matter of fact, one is called the Lamb's Book of Life. So when Jesus begins to open that book and he starts writing things about you in that book, don't you worry about the books of this world. Don't worry about the books that the doctors keep. Don't worry about the books that the accountants keep during tax season. Don't you worry about the books that the banks keep. Don't you worry about the books that the lawyers keep. Just know that God has a set of books and whatever he decides to write about you, whatever he decides to say about your situation, whatever he decides to pin in there about you, just know that if he said it, I believe it and that settles it. Tell somebody, what did I tell you? Now, if we be honest, we can't be too hard on Martha. We can't be too hard on her. Right? Because Jesus is doing something a little different with her than what he's done in times past. Right? And you look at the other two times where he raised somebody, Jesus got there pretty quickly. They called on Jesus and, you know, kind of got deviated a couple one time, but he still got there soon enough. Or the person had just died. And he went and touched, went and spoke. But this time, look what he did. He said, let's hang out a second. John 11, 4 through 7. It says, when Jesus heard that, meaning he heard the report that Lazarus was sick and Martha asked him to come, heal her brother. Right? So it says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. 
Now, Jesus loved Martha, right? Said he loved her and her sister and Lazarus. So he loved the family. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So he loved the family. And because I love him so much, I'm going to hang out a little longer. Is that what it said in your Bible? Then after this, he said to the, after this, after the days went by, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. <laughs> there are times when those that are closest to God won't see the immediate benefit of a performance or answer to a prayer from God. See, a lot of times, a lot of times, we want to be in that place when we just pray and everything just happened. Right? I, pray, I sought the Lord. He heard my cry. This poor man cried. Right? But it says he loved the family and he waited. So there's something about that relationship. There's something about relationship with Christ that he'll begin to use you to show his glory. People who don't believe or new saints need to see the miracles. People who don't believe or new saints need to see Jesus act immediately. But when you start to develop your relationship... <laughs> When you start to become intimate with God, when you start to truly walk with God, when you start to truly talk with God and hear him tell you that you are his own, there's some things he's going to say to you, but because you're close to him, he's going to expect you to walk on just more for his word, not so much because of his works. Right? See, that's what God is doing. God uses our situations to mature us. Right? He uses our situations to mature us, to make us grow up spiritually, right? See, we want to call down power from heaven, but we don't want to sit with the power, right? <laughs> Paul said, if I suffer with him, <laughs> I shall reign with him, all that I might know him in his suffering and the power of his resurrection. See, we want God to service us, but we don't want to suffer with him. And it don't work like that. It don't work like that. I'm sorry, I thought I would never say it, but it's the truth. In the Western world, we have destroyed what the gospel is. Or too many of us, not everybody. Too many of us have destroyed what the gospel is. The gospel is about salvation. Notice I didn't say anything else. The gospel is about salvation. Full stop. Right? And once you get saved, it's about relationship. The Holy Spirit comes in to help us to grow up spiritually so that we don't need to have signs and wonders all the time just because we're going through something. No, we'll speak the word of the wonder and we'll go through these things and watch God work. For it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Right? David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And then he gets on and said, goodness and mercy shall follow me. But see, he's walking in determination based off of a word, not because of a work. All of the works are happening behind him because of his relationship and intimacy. Because the beginning of the 23rd Psalm, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. And the name that's used for Lord there is the name that God gave himself for identification. That's the name that he gave himself for intimacy. That's the name that he gave himself so that he could relate with the children of Israel. 
because he wanted to be known to them other than just this big old mysterious thing. He gave himself a name so that they can relate to him and be intimate. And David says, that Lord is my shepherd. When we start to grow up in Christ, when we start to grow up in Christ, do we still suffer the things that the world is going through? Right? We still go through the things that the world is going through. But we begin to move on marching orders. We may not see the battle ending. We may see all of the destruction. But because we have a mission assignment, because we have marching orders, we'll still do whatever because we know the one who gave us the orders is the one who also promises to give us the victory. I was thinking this morning, I was thinking this morning, one time Danny was, Danny was about three years old. My son, my second son, he's about three years old. David was playing football on a team in North Freeport, right here at Atkinson. And Danny was playing soccer on the soccer team down in South Freeport at Randall Field. And it's at the same time. And we only had one car. So, I knew David was getting out early, so I told Danny, when your practice is over, you stay right there on the field. Daddy's coming to get you. Don't move. I go get David. His practice ran a little late, of course. But when I get to South Freeport to go pick up Danny, Danny is standing in the middle of the field with the coaches. I didn't think too much of it, but all the kids were gone, you know, because again, I was late. And I'm, so I'm just, why is he standing there? So when I get there, he's standing there with a smile. And the coaches said, we tried to take him to the car. We tried to take him off the field because it was cold outside. We tried to put him somewhere that we thought was safe. But he said, my father told me that he's coming back to get me and that I should not move but stay right here and don't move until he gets here to come get me. What I'm saying to you is that boy told them, my father told me not to move. So when we get into trouble, when we go through life's vicissitudes, when we have to deal with certain things, all we have to do is stand on what God said. All we have to do is stand on what the word says and if God says don't move don't you move if God says lift your hands lift your hands if God says open your mouth open your mouth if God says go into a fiery furnace go into a fiery furnace because it's the Lord who told you it's the God of creation that said it so all we need to know is that God said it we believe it and that settles it There'll be times when he'll tell us to go do something that not only takes time to materialize, but initially doesn't make sense. He said, Noah, go build an ark. That'll probably take quite a few years to build, put some animals in it, and while you're at it, preach the same message over and over for about 40 years. And stay there until the rain comes. Oh, and by the way, I'll explain what rain is later. He told Gideon, I need you to lead an army of a few hundred men that'll drink like dogs. You guys are going to go up against an army of a hundred plus thousand Midianites. Oh, yeah, by the way, you really won't actually fight. But what I want you to do is I want you to scream. I want you to break some glass and holler. He told Hosea, that one you're about to marry, she gonna cheat on you a few times, but take her back each time. 
As a matter of fact, you're going to go back into paid services. And you'll probably have to pay to get her back. I'll explain it later. Sometimes God sends us in situations or allows situations to happen and he's not worried about or really doesn't care too much about what we think. He just wants to know, do we believe that what he said will come to pass? Do we believe that he'll be the one who'll strengthen us in the valley? Sometimes we as believers will have to sit and watch the enemy stir up stuff all around us. We have to sit and watch people tell lies about us. Amen. We have to sit through gossip and not go check nobody. Amen. Right? We have to sit through all the finger pointing and not point any fingers back. Everybody's spilling tea, but yet you got a whole, a whole box of tea bags you can spill, but you got to keep it on the shelf. Right? Right? Holy Spirit tell you, shut up, hold your peace, hold your peace. Well, God, why I got to be quiet? They talking because I told you to shut up. That's why. Because I'm going to get some glory out of your silence. I'm going to get some glory out of your obedience. I'm going to get some glory out of you not fighting back and standing there showing love. But I've read in the Bible that where it says, but when my enemies and even my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Notice it didn't say when he came upon me eating my flesh, I tripped them, right? It don't say you tripped them. It said they stumbled and fell, right? Jesus wants us to get to the point of no matter what's going on in our lives, we'll let nothing deter us from trusting in what he said. Regardless of what we're experiencing in the natural temporal, he wants us to focus on the spiritual eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18. I'm sorry, media team, I think I skipped a little bit. Please forgive me. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look, look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. Temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Trusting in what Jesus said will always be our strength in our hardest times. But we must be careful not to give in to our own feelings about what's happening. It's easy to fall back on what we know. It's easy to go back on what you were taught. It's easy to go back to what you were conditioned to believe by trying something and it failing, trying something and it failing, trying something and it succeeds, succeeds but you get taken out of it. Trying something and it succeeds and someone else gets the credit, right? So we get conditioned. We lose hope, right? because we're stuck on what this world's, the world's methods are for dealing with hardships and trials. If we're not careful, we'll try everything but what Jesus said concerning our trials. We have to get to the point that no matter what's going on or what we're going through, we'll take God at his word and trust him. Sometimes we get like Martha and start telling Jesus about how big our problems are. That's the time we should tell our problems about how big our God is and what he said. Because remember, God is the same God that spoke and created the earth. He's the same God that has the power to call those things that be not as though they were. He's the same God that spoke and created the birds in the air. He's the one that spoke and made the heavens in the sky. He's the one that spoke and told the winds and waves to be at peace. It's because of what he said. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. He's the one that said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, he's the one that said, I am the resurrection and, come on, and the life. Everything that he said, we have to rehearse. We have to go over all the things that God said to us. 
Because it's in the battle that we need to, when we, it's in the battle that when we see the enemy advancing, that our weapons are, are not carnal, but they're mighty to God to pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ. So we have to put God's word into action so that it brings those strongholds down in our own minds, right? Remember, God is the one who took that fish sandwich and fed over 5,000 and was responsible for the largest fish fry known to mankind. Right? Y'all laughing, but you know it's true. God is the one that when he speaks, things happen. We have to get to the point that we trust him beyond no matter what. That whatever he says about me, this is going to be so. If he says I'm going to be healed, then I'm going to walk in my healing. If he says that my mind is going to be regulated, I'm going to walk in a new mind, set mind frame. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take on the mind of Christ. If he says that I will walk and not die, then I'm going to walk and continue living. If he says that I'm going to walk through this with iron shoes, then I'm going to put those shoes on. If he tells me that I'm going to make it through all of my hardships, I'm going through every hardship with victory. If he tells me that I'm going to walk through this sickness and come out better than what I was before I went in, then I'm going in better looking to come out. If God tells me that I'm going to go through this river and not drown, then I'm going in doing the backstroke. If God tells me I'm going to walk through the fire and the fire won't consume me, I'm walking through with my sunglasses on. As a matter of fact, if God tells me he's going to turn all the grass into cheese, I'm going to start by selling crackers. Because whatever God says is going to be, I know it's going to come to pass. Whatever God says he's going to make happen, I know soon and very soon it's going to come to pass. So we're not going to fret over what the world is doing. We're not going to fret over what the enemy is doing. Because we know that our God is a good God. We know that whatever God says will come to pass. We know that that God is the one who spoke and created the heavens and earth. We know that God is the one who speaks and causes things that be not to come as though they were. Give God a praise. Come on and praise God because you know what he said to you. Come on and praise God because you know what he said to you. It may not look like what, you, what he said. It may not look like what you need it to be. But we know that whatever God has said, whatever he has put in the atmosphere, whatever he has put out there, not the universe, because the universe was created, but whatever the creator of the universe says, it will come to pass. Give God a praise. Come on and praise the name of Jesus. Come on and praise the name of Jesus. For his word says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run in and they are safe. The word lets us know that some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. But when I get into trouble, I will remember the name of my Lord. Come on and give that God a praise. Everybody that can stand, please stand. Everyone that can stand, please stand. Sometimes we get like Martha. We hold Jesus back to what we think about a situation. Sometimes we remove ourselves from his deliverance, from his power. We remove ourselves from receiving because of what we put on him based on our knowledge. But it's not by our knowledge, it's by his word. God is sending salvation to some of you right now. God is sending salvation to some of you right now because the fact is all of us go through things but only the believer has the promise of victory. If you aren't a believer, you don't have that promise. But what he did promise you as an unbeliever is that he will save you in spite of what you're doing. He will save you because of your sins. 
that you don't have to stay in a sinful life, but you can come and experience the victory in Jesus because all your sins will have been washed away. And for even for those of us who, who are believers, we don't experience that victory because we're still locked into that old mindset. The Bible lets us know that if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature or creation. So we have to take on the newness of thought. We have to take on the newness of life. Not that taking on the newness of life means that there's no more suffering. That's a lie. That's a lie. Suffering will be here until Jesus comes to take us out. And then when he comes back to set up to establish his kingdom rule, then suffering will cease. But Jesus didn't come back. The rapture didn't happen. I hope not. And he definitely didn't come back for his second coming. So that means suffering will still be here. So believer and unbeliever will suffer the same things. But the believer will suffer these things with the promise of Christ's help. The unbeliever will suffer on his own. So I say first to the unbeliever. Will you turn away from your sins and accept Jesus today? Will you say that I know that I'm a sinner and my life is sinful, but because Jesus loves me so much, I want to give him my sins and take his salvation. Will you say that? As a matter of fact, let's all lift our hands and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying just for me. And because you said that if I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that God has raised you from the dead, I can be saved. So Lord Jesus, I, I submit to you and surrender to you and turn from my sins, but turn to your salvation. So by your grace, and through my faith in what you said, I believe I'm saved. By your grace, through my faith in what you said, I know now you can make me whole. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all of those who prayed that prayer, whether it's here in this building or online. God, I pray that you'll touch their hearts even now, that the work of salvation will begin to happen inside of them that even if they don't quite feel like they're saved, that their understanding and belief will be that they are saved because you said that they are. That if they believe in you, that they will be saved. So Father, I pray for them right now that you'll continue to complete the work of salvation and sanctification in their lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray.